The moon one can. Case 14. Once the monks of the western and eastern halls were arguing about a cat. Nansen, holding up the cat, said, You monks, if you can say a word of Zen, I will spare the cat. Otherwise, I will kill it. No one could answer, so Nansen cut the cat in two. That evening, when Joshua returned, Nansen told him of the incident. Joshua thereupon took off his sandal, put it on his head and walked off. Nansen said, if you'd been there, the cat would have been saved. The commentary. Just say, what is the real meaning of Joshua's putting his saddle on his head? If you can give a turning word on this point, you will see that Nansen's action was not in vain. But if not, beware. The verse. Had Joshua only been there, he would have taken charge. He would have snatched away the sword and Nansen would have begged for his life. This is an important koan and a difficult one also. Um, if you read around the commentaries, um, they probably contradict each other more than usual. And we have this additional factor that in the West, we really like cats. And it's very easy to get absorbed in the question of the cat. Um, which isn't wrong. <laughs> so the koan well, the cat is really, literally, central to the koan, and not. And, as always, there's a balance to be held. There's a knife edge to be walked without falling one side or the other. So let's think this through. Well, like a lot of the best koans, this is immediate, it grabs you. Um, it's as if, and there's probably a tendency in most of us to react like that. It's as if you were just walking along the road and suddenly I jump out from behind a hedge and go, I've got this cat and I'm gonna kill it unless you say something really, really smart now. And you go, It's your fault, the blood is on your hands. Mm. Um, and it both is and isn't like that. So let's think this through a little bit. Once the monks in the Western and Eastern halls were arguing about a cat. So we have the Western and the Eastern halls and they have a body of monks in both of them and their little group, their little gang and you have the Western monks and the Eastern Hall monks and they're arguing about a cat. And this is the kind of first really sweet bit in the kind of confusion amongst the commentaries because what are commentaries for? Well far from diving in to the straight true, one true meaning of the koan, they start to fill in the gaps, just like we always do, just like we all do. We hear a story, we want to fill in the gaps, we want to, to understand it in our own way, we start making it up. So, according to one line of thought, the argument is about possession of the cat. It's the uh, resident mouser. Chinese monasteries were not famous for liking animals. Uh, they weren't particularly fond of strays wandering in, but cats they quite liked because obviously they catch mice, they catch rats. That's going to be a problem in a monastery. Yeah, relatively technologically simple. Like no sealed doors, lots of rice lying about. Not lying about. 
but you get the idea. So they're arguing about the cat. And they like the cat, it's the only animal. It's a bit of light entertainment as well, we can watch the cat. So, the West Hall monks like the cat being in the West Hall. The East Hall cats, sorry, the East Hall monks like the cat being in the East Hall. And it's an argument about possession. As soon as I have a self, I can start arguing about possession. And it's quite interesting that it's not these monks arguing as individuals, but they're a little group, they're a little team. It's like a match, the East Hall versus the West Hall. Who's going to get the cat? Who's going to get the cat? We're separate. The second line of thought is, that is far too trivial. Zen monks wouldn't argue about a thing like that. No, it's deep. It's like the first koan in the Mumun Khan. Has a dog Buddha nature? No, but all animals have Buddha nature. All beings have Buddha nature. Does a cat, sorry, does a dog have Buddha nature? No. So there's a line of thought that says, well, actually, the, the discussion, the argument is about this. Does a cat have Buddha neighbor, nature? And they're squabbling amongst themselves, falling out. It kind of works both ways because there's possession here too, isn't there? There's possession of the truth. There's possession of the knowledge. No, we know about the cat. We know that the cat doesn't have Buddha nature. We know that the cat does have Buddha nature. And it's the same thing. And again, it's individuals banding together to form a team with a view, an opinion, that's separate, distinct. So we have the East Hall and West Hall as a physical metaphor. But then beyond that, we have the exemplification of separation. We're going to form teams, we're going to dispute. And as I say, actually, it's the same thing, whether they're being incredibly profound or they just want the mouser in their hall. Doesn't matter. It's separation. And that's what's being shown, exemplified here. So Nansen, the teacher, wanders past and he's got this ridiculous group of idiot monks squabbling about the cat. What do you do? Well, I had a friend who, when she was young, fell out with her sister over a tennis racket. It was kind of her tennis racket, but her sister wanted to use it. So her father, who's not a particularly nice man, walks up, smashes the tennis racket in front of them both and says, there, play with that. And to an extent, we've got the offer of the same kind of response. Shh. See this? You're fighting about this? Is this, is this what monks should be doing? Say a word of Zen. Say a word of Zen now. Or I'll cut the cat in half. And it's meant to be in your face and it's meant to, oh, shock, because confronted like that, what are you going to do? But does Nansen want you to say something remarkably zenny, something amusing, or simply... What a lot of idiots we're being. Why are we fighting about the cat? That's the whole point. And of course, actually, splitting the Sangha, which is what these monks are actually doing, is, well, it's against the precepts. You're breaking the precepts when you do that. It's one of the more fundamental ones. You don't divide the Sangha. You don't turn people against each other. And as I say, they're exemplifying that kind of separation on which all dispute and all selfish fighting are based. And we keep coming back to these themes, don't we? How do you disagree without actual conflict? How do we manage disagreement? So, is Nansen just being a kind of violent, we'll sort this out, figure? Well, no, because there's a lot of symbolism here as well. Obviously, as soon as he takes up a knife, oh, well, he's actually taking up the sword of Manjushri, the great Bodhisattva Manjushri, whose sword is the sword of wisdom. Cuts illusion, cuts delusion away. So it's a sense in which the cat is the object about which they're squabbling. What do you do? You cut out the object. 
but I think there's a more in this. Yeah, there's layers and layers and layers and layers of this. It gets much, much more interesting, much more intimate in a way than that. A cat both is and isn't like a group of monks. In a way, threatening to kill a cat, we're saying this, this with the knife at its throat, this is the great matter of life and death. This is what Zen is. Why are you squabbling like this? You should be dealing with the great matter of life and death. And instead, you're arguing about nothing. This is life and death. And to do that, and to mean that, he has to, at a certain level, intend, be very serious, about killing the cat. If he's just going, look, look. What's that? It has to, no. I'll do it. Speak, speak. Now this story obviously rhymes with the story about Solomon and the two women claiming both to be the mother of the child. Solomon has the women brought before him and of course he famously says in his infinite wisdom, let's simply cut the child in half, then you could have half each. And of course the true mother says, no, let the other woman have the child. With the implication, obviously, I love the child more than I love having it. What's really important is that the child lives. So we are here in the absolute presence of the great matter of life and death. But of course it only works if Solomon, in a certain sense, absolutely intends to cut the child in half. Like all great stories, what would have happened if the true mother hadn't said that? What would he have done? I don't know. What would have been an appropriate response? But there is a difficulty here, because it's a huge difficulty. Killing the cat? Well, that's very much against the precepts. That's the first precept. Absolutely, we don't kill living creatures for a monk. That's way more important than it is for a lay person. So, if Nansen kills the cat, he breaks the precept. He really offends against his monastic vows. So is just teaching a bunch of monks a quick Zen lesson? Does that justify breaking his monastic vows and killing the cat? It's even worse than that, actually, because, you know, normally in these stories, whoever it is, the teacher says the zeny thing to the student, and the student has a great realisation and goes off, changed, different, experiencing the world differently. What does the current says nothing. The monks were just monks before having a squabble, and afterwards they were just standing around, presumably looking stupid about what happened here. Maybe 20 years later, then one has some great moment of insight, but we're not told that. So actually, Nansen has killed the cat for nothing. It's a failure. He's failed. It's a dead fail as a coa. Hmm, problem. The point he's trying to make by threatening the cat is, this is the great matter of life and death. If I cut this cat in two, it is dead. But by squabbling this way, you kill the Dharma. You kill your under well, you kill your understanding, your experience, that we are not separate, that we are whole. In Bernie Glassman's words, we're one body. You do something far worse than me killing a cat. You're doing it already. But then it's the most trite of cliches will tell us two wrongs don't make a right. He's still out killing the cat. So 
So Joshua's been out for the day and he comes back. Anson tells him about this. Have you been... Well, yeah, this is what happened, by the way. I killed the cat. Joshua just takes off his grass sandal, places it on his head, and walks. We've started off with an absolute separation of East and West. And so here we're given a mixture of up and down. Feet are obviously, sorry, shoes, sandals are obviously for the feet. Placing it on one's head is ridiculous. It's to get high and low muddled. We can go anywhere we like with that. But it's also, according to Robert Aitken, it's also a mark of mourning in ancient China. And so Joshu shows respect to the cat, the cat that was, the cat that's given its life in an unsuccessful attempt to teach a bunch of monks about Zen and walks off. Do we see that as being critical of Nansen? Do we see that as saying, teacher, you failed? But there's another problem here as well. If, if Joshua had been there, if you'd been there, says Nansen, that's not very Zen. We don't do hypotheticals, we do with the actuality of this moment. It's not if. Oh, well, if. And the commentary in the verse both take up that. If Joshua had been there, Nansen would have begged for his life. He would have said the word of Zen. He would have metaphorically, at least, maybe actually, Zen was quite hands-on, quite physical in those days, grab the sword from Nansen, had it at his throat. Which is, of course, in one sense, the only correct response, because you don't value the life of a cat. Your life is worth exactly the same as the life of a cat. Beg, beg. Now within the koan curriculum, whereby you study one koan after another, I am given to understand. I am not a, <laughs> in no way a koan expert. I am playing with the koan with you. See what we can make together. Let's find out, it's fun. Within the koan curriculum, most of the answers take the form of an identification with, a miming, a playing along with. So one possible answer here would be, meow. You become the cat. You become the cat that's being killed. You are killed by the example. You are killed by Zen. Your understanding is challenged. And lots of the commentaries have this idea that the cat dies to give life to the monk's understanding. The cat dies but thereby becomes alive because, it, you know, it's preserved forever in the koan and becomes a light to us all. That sounds like guff to me, to be honest. Also, of course, obviously, this koan engages with the relative and the absolute. Quite complex here. I don't want to go too far into that. Non-separation, of course, being the side of the absolute. Then the kind of intimacy of our actual experience of the relative world all around us. The intimacy of the cat being threatened and killed or not. Um, So it's the side of non-separation, the side of the absolute, which we're trying to point to, or which Nansen is trying to point to. And in doing that, in theory, in the example of the story, the cat's life is, 
expendable because ultimately nothing dies. There is no birth, no death, no becoming, no ceasing, no path, no wisdom and no goal. Understand this. Zen is, insofar as it deals with the absolute, Zen is above this. There's another very famous Zen teacher, I won't name names, um, who has a weird... Yeah, okay, I'm being judgmental. I apologise for that. Who has what I personally find a somewhat weird take on this, which is, is Zen above ethics? Is Zen above morality? Well, the answer very often given is yes. But I liked his attempt to hedge it, which is, is Zen above morality? Yes. But morality is not beneath Zen. Okay, so I probably don't buy that either. But again, how does this strike you? What's this saying to you? It's ultimately if we take that approach, though, that we start running very grave risks. Because if no harm has actually been done killing the cat, then no harm has actually been done when the Japanese army invades Korea before the Second World War. No harm has been done at Pearl Harbor. Actually, obviously, no harm has been done at Hiroshima because nobody was born and so nobody has died. Is that the right way of understanding the absolute? What are the precepts? What is our study actually for? Now I mentioned the Japanese invasion of Korea because then, and I do go on about this a bit, was notably complicit in the Japanese cultivation of an imperial nationalist ideology before the Second World War. Did nothing to speak out against it. Actually concretely promoted it. The Japanese Empire was going to save the world by bringing the Dharma to the whole world. At the point of a gun and at the dropping of a bomb. So did Nansen kill the cat? That's what we all want to know. So-and-so says yes, so-and-so says no. An awful lot of Western teachers say, but of course Nansen didn't kill the cat. Ha! Ha! And, well again, we need to tell a story, don't we? We need to finish the story. We need to make it up. We're not happy that we... Don't know. Because Ganson has to be a good guy. He has to be an exemplary teacher. He's enlightened, for heaven's sake. Of course he... Hmm. I don't know whether to give you the most... what well, I find the most convincing version. Is that... I shouldn't really, should I? I should really say, we don't know. This is another fantastic opportunity for us to not know. Why do we want to know? Why do we want to finish it? It's a story for heaven's sake. Might have happened a thousand years ago. And I don't really want you to go away and go, but did he kill a cat? Oh, I don't know, but he didn't. So I will say what I find the most convincing one is that having made his demonstration, having seriously intended, you know, say something, I will kill this cat. In terms of the story, his monks are such a load of, well, maybe they're just so shocked, maybe just exactly like us. Maybe they're just, oh, he kills the cat just by throwing it down as cats often are and of course it rolls over and runs off maybe maybe because the monks having failed to learn the lesson what's the point of killing the cat 
or not? I don't know.